Verizon says it's 11 o'clock, so I think we'll go ahead and, and get started as people find their, their seats in the back of the room. Welcome. Dr. Andrada and other honored guests of the World Food Prize, distinguished members of the Grandview faculty, staff colleagues, alumni and friends, and Grandview students. Uh, with great pleasure and deep pride, I welcome you to this annual World Food Prize address on Grandview's campus. As is now customary, our World Food Prize address occurs during Grandview's Global Vision Week. And I think uh, the timing really couldn't be better. Because while we are spending time this week on our campus directing our attention to, uh, to outward, outward from the institution to heighten our global awareness, there are other people in town as well. There are government and business and NGO leaders from all around the globe that have gathered in Des Moines this week to focus on world hunger and food security issues both locally and worldwide. Our focus for this Global Vision Week has been on immigration. And throughout history, one of the reasons people have chosen to emigrate to new lands has been to escape famine or hunger or food insecurity. So while Dr. Andrada's topic may not appear at first glance to fit into a week about immigration, it most certainly is in an indirect way. The work that individuals like Dr. Andrada have done to increase food security in developing countries reduces the need for entire populations to migrate to foreign lands. Today's address also connects us to other academic communities around the state of Iowa and beyond. Our speaker's participation today is made possible by the World Food Prize Foundation, based right here in Des Moines, and is in honor of Dr. Norman E. Borlaug, the Iowa native and Nobel laureate, who is credited with launching the Green Revolution and saving a billion lives through his research and development of food crops, primarily in third world countries. Other World Food Prize laureates and guests are visiting numerous other colleges and university campuses uh, today and this week as a part of this year's World Food Prize celebration here in Des Moines. And finally, one of the hallmarks of Grandview's rich Danish heritage and our current mission is lifelong learning. So all of us, regardless of our age or our educational level or our academic background, are here to learn and to learn from today's distinguished guest speaker. Thank you for being a part of this tradition. I now invite Dr. Carl Moses forward, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you and welcome. Grandview University is pleased to host Dr. Maria Andrade as part of the World Food Prize Week in honor of the prize's founder, the late Norman E. Borlaug. Dr. Andrade's address adds another rich perspective to our Global Vision Week activities. Dr. Andrade grew up in the Cape Verde Islands and completed her primary schooling there. Recognizing the value of a good education, her parents sent her to live with an older brother on Santiago Island so she could attend a good high school. After graduation, she taught high school math and science for two years in her home country before being identified by the U.S. Agency for, uh, for International Development, USAID, to be sent to college in the United States. She studied agronomy at the University of Arizona with support from an African American Institute scholarship. Dr. Andrade received her bachelor in science degree and her master's in science degree from, in plant genetics from the University of Arizona and then she attended North Carolina State University where she earned her PhD in plant breeding and plant physiology. A mentor encouraged her to take a leading role in efforts focused on the improvement of food security in the developing countries of Africa, and she became interested in the biofortified crops after working on root crops in 1985 and during her PhD research on the sweet potato. A major turning point in Dr. Andrade's life occurred when she was invited to join the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture. This allowed her the opportunity to work in Southern Africa, and this exposure to the international agricultural research environment helped to broaden her perspective and showed her the important role she could play in fostering food security. Her work in this area was affirmed when she learned that nearly 70% of the children in Mozambique 
suffer from a vitamin A deficiency. And her research on biofortified orange fleshed sweet potato began in 1997 in areas of sub Saharan Africa with intensive trials leading to the release of nine drought, to drought tolerant varieties distributed to farmers in Mozambique in 2001. Her value chain approach incorporated both socio market and agro processing strategies to ensure a sustainable program for the long term to address food insecurity, malnutrition, and income generation. Later, with support from USAID, Dr. Andrade conducted the first large-scale field testing of 58 orange-fleshed sweet potato varieties that came from the US, China, Kenya, and Tanzania. The results of this testing showed that eight varieties provided high yields. While partnering with the Mozambique government and USAID, in, in 2000, following a horrific flood, these top yielding varieties were distributed to 123 households. Her strong advocacy has resulted in the Orange Flesh Sweet Potato Program in Mozambique being referred to as the calling card for biofortification work in Sub-Saharan Africa. It is my distinct honor and privilege to present to you our 2017 World Food Prize Address Speaker, Dr. Maria Andrade. It's still morning, so <laughs> good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh -huh. I'm very happy to be here, and thank you very much for the very best introduction of Maria Andrade you just did. I even forgot. So this morning, what I want, would like to share with you, uh, this is, it, it is a, a road of my life because, like he said, I was born in Cape Verde Island, which is a very, very, very poor country in Africa, from a very humble family, and uh, where I had to make it. But we always believe that to make it is through education. And I really love academy, I really love people around school, because that is when one way that every one of you can really walk that road for the, for the very vibrant future. So what I want to present to you is, is uh, I, I went to school in North Carolina. I, I, were, I did breeding, sweet potato breeding. It opened really my eyes that uh, as a crop, a very humble crop like sweet potato, if you really work on it, you could re anything can be good, any contribution can be outstanding if you take it every day and each step one by one. So what I want to share with you is the, uh, is the work that was done in Mozambique, because I, I, this is the work I'm presenting you, is a work of 22 years. So every good thing takes time. It takes planning, it takes time for you to build. Of course you learn it, your mistake and you repair it and you keep on going, so don't get frustrated because you cannot do it once. You have to really try the best way. So as I reached Mozambique in 1995, uh, Mozambique was coming from a major war, civil war. So basically there was nothing around. Like, uh, like uh, the, the rate of malnutrition, the indicators were so bad. 72% uh, of uh, children under five suffer from vitamin A deficiency. Malnutrition was by then about 59%, which means nothing can be worse. And uh, the, the UNICEF was covering uh, the vitamin A supplementation, but the country has no road, nothing, and most of the children could not be reached with the vitamin A. I realized I went to school in the US, I did better carotene vitamin A, and there was some strong idea how we could use sweet potato to address malnutrition and vitamin A deficiency. And, but there was no sweet potato orange flesh in the country, so I had to introduce them, evaluate them, and propose to 
partners, how we could really reach those women in the village to really grow and feed their children. So the story that I'm going to tell you is my road, what I did in Mozambique, and what we are doing right now in Africa with the experience of Mozambique to address malnutrition using food-based approach, which is orange flesh, sweet potato. But, uh, but before I, I, I do that, I would like to show you, because our situation is not uh, uh, very good. If you see, there is seven billion people in this world, about 800 million people go to bed without food, and are mostly in Africa. Uh, two billion are micronutrient deficient. Uh, so if you see, we have a challenge. We are facing a challenge. And us as a scientist, especially you as a young scientist, we need to really look at what we can do. If you see, for example, when we, we, have, we are in a malnourished nation, uh, six of the top risk factor driving the global burden of disease are related to diet. We have the stunting. Sometimes you see in Africa a child that's very stunted. He, he looks like a three years old child, but indeed he's 10 or 11. At the same time, we are facing right now in some nation with overweight and obesity. And this is also very serious because it's, it's giving rise to diabetes and all other cardiovascular disease which are considered non-communicable disease. So we know we understand that we have made some progress, but we have challenge. We have <coughs> children that die prematurely. We have poor development, and, and the disease in Africa remains. Like I said, right now in Mozambique, 40% of children under five are stunted. And 69% right now are vitamin A deficiency. Uh, and, uh, and this is due because only one child out of 10 child has sufficient nutrient to have to grow potentially, the potential they have. Alone in Mozambique, the government spent $1 billion, which is 11% of the GDP, to solve the problem of malnourished of malnutrition. The progress is slow. Even you have all this movement talking about nutrition, global panel, but we're still, we're still going very, very slow to address malnutrition and have our children to grow healthy and to, to become a grown up and to produce the whole nation. So we, we know now for sure that food alone cannot solve the problem. We need to re use our resource more efficiently. We need to promote food diversity. We need to also to, you know, in, the, in Africa, those women are those to, to cook in the house. So we need to empower them to use their money, the little they have, more efficiently, to, to be able to address the diet in the, in, the, in the house more efficiently. But again, though, we know also we need to really develop also technology. Technology is the clue. We need to look also, because right now we know we have the floods, we have the drought, and we have the climate change. Now we need to really look into resilience of seed. But again, though, we need to really change the way we communicate. If you see in this table, I have this, this cloth. This is a very powerful communication strategy to address vitamin A deficiency in Africa through using food-based approach, which is orange flesh, sweet potato. And this orange you see is the orange flesh. It tells those women you should feed your children with orange flesh, sweet potato, because it's the only sweet that gives health. As you know, all other sweets are very bad for your health. So we wrap those women in the village. They dance in it, because most of them cannot, cannot uh, uh, write or read so we use all these visual things to really make them to learn, because they only have three years of formal school, which is very limited for the understand. So we use social market strategy to address this, 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 this thing. So as you know, to tackle malnutrition is a very complex situation. Not only using sweet potato, which is rich in vitamin A, which is naturally bred, can address the, 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 the malnutrition. We also can use other source, other source which you call supplementation, which is provide vitamin A, 
or we could also use food fortification. In Africa now we are fortifying our wheat flour that is used to made, make bread with iron and zinc. But this is very costly, it's not uh, sustainable because you have to go back and forth to, to, to fortify. But also we are promoting dietary diversification as source of minerals and vitamins in the food. So let us explain what biofortification is about. Biofortification is um, a way that you cross, I'm talking, like, like I said, my, all, most of my examples are examples with sweet potato because that is what I know. So as we cross different sorts of sweet potato, we select those that are good with very high level of vitamin A, iron, and zinc. This is the process that you produce a sweet potato that comes with all nutrients, but they are biofortified, contrary with fortification that you add, or another way, dietary diversification. I'm very sure you are, you are studying maybe biology. You heard also, if you fertilize a crop with, for example, zinc, you could harvest sweet potato roots that are higher in, ring, in zinc. This is, you are using agronomic practices to be able to build nutrient in a crop to, ta to tackle ma micronutrients. So this is what we, co we call biofortification. So, and when you do it, you don't compromise any other trait. It's the right thing to do. It is, we prove that it's very cost effective because once you for biofortify the sweet potato, you bring those vines to those women in the village, they can grow those vines over and over again with zero cost. For the smallholder farmers in Africa who are very poor, this is the way to go. It's cost effective, it's cheap once you develop, and the only thing you need to do is to build into your system in the mainstream those genes, those, uh, those traits that are responsible for vitamin A, iron and zinc, and other traits of interest, which is drought tolerance, vine vigor, and so forth. So, as you see how we breed biofortified crop, usually the process, you go all over, you collect germplasm. I collect my germplasm in the US, because US, US labs is a source of good planting material, because they have been selected for so many years for deep orange flesh. So you collect everywhere, then you start to make your cross. <coughs> As you make your cross, then you select what you want. As you select and you evaluate with using a high throughput machine like near infrared, then you evaluate through different stage, and then you select the best. And the best you select, then you take to multi, what we call multi-location trials. You take them to several locations where he, the environment, the effect of the environment is measured in there. Then you select with those that are general adapted. <coughs> those that are specifically adapted, then you propose the government of that country for a release. This is the process. So in this process, like you see, there is a good reason to justify why we, we do biofortified crop, why we breed for biofortification. Like we said, two, million, two billion people suffer from macronutrient deficiency. Over the last 50 years, we improve a lot in terms of yield, but still the, 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 the nutrition in our staple crop is still very, very low, and you, we know, for example, in our study that if you feed a child with sweet potato that is rich in vitamin A, you increase the level of seroretinol in the blood, which is an indicator of vitamin A, vitamin A, vitamin A in, the, in the, the status of vitamin A in that child. In, and also there is a study that if every dollars you invest with biofortification, you have a return of $17. What else? And also, once you bring a biofortified crop in the village to an African woman, it stays in there. As you know, in Africa, those women in the village, they are not used to buy because they don't have cash. 
but they eat what they have. So this approach is very good way to go. So, but we still have challenge with biofortification, we know. We have a challenge of, uh, challenge, uh, of uh, strategy to deliver the seed because it's not really very straightforward. We, are, we have also, we need to really identify that it really has a health impact. We need to, to, to develop a better understanding of the how food impact every one consuming the food. Uh, we need to really ha get the agricultural people to prioritize those biofortified crop. We need to put those agricultural people with the nutrition people to talk the same language because often they don't talk the same language. They are different people. And also, we need also, because I will give you some example, we need to develop a consumer demand. Because we believe if you develop that demand, you could, the farmer could be growing more, then more people will be using the, the, the crop and so forth. And we need to integrate biofortification into the public and private uh, policies program. And in this way, government also must be involved. So it's very complex. It's multi-sectorial one, just food itself, just breeding program cannot make it. Okay, what I want to, draw, to show you is the, what kind of evidence we had in Mozambique that uh, really show that we have an impact by feeding people with our vitamin A rich sweet potato. But before I start, let me tell you what sweet potato is. Um, I don't know if you ever, if you ever ate sweet potato before, uh, but I know when I was going to school in North Carolina, I've been in festival, I've been eating sweet potato, and that's where I acquire all my knowledge and passion for the orange flesh sweet potato, because we did not have any orange flesh sweet potato in Africa. Orange flesh sweet potato, when you cut inside this orange, is the source of vitamin A. The deeper the orange, the more vitamin A that sweet potato has. So sweet potato is grown in Africa, in some countries as a primary crop, but in other countries, in other places as a secondary crop. Um, and it's, sweet potato is very productive compared with many other crops. Per unit area, sweet potato has more productivity than maize or any other crop you think about. It's very easy to grow. The females can grow it, and they can really have high productivity to feed their children. We have a yield of you see, 15 tons with the material we have in our, for hectares or to 25, that's okay. And in Africa, it's a lifesaver for the poor. Because where you cannot grow maize, you cannot grow beans, sweet potato will always be there as a food security crop. That's why we call it a classical food security crop. And when is orange flesh sweet potato, is a food security and nutrition crop. And what is nice about sweet potato, you, I'm sure you had generic, Sweet potato is, 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 is an exploit. It means like during the cellular division, you have six copies of chromosomes pairing at the, at the metaphase, and you know, you can, they can cross anything possible. That's why we consider it genetic diversity of sweet potato is too huge. That's why we, can, we don't need to go GMO, because the genetic, the diversity is there that you can select for whatever you want. That's the beauty of sweet potato. That's why I have collection right now of purple flesh, yellow flesh, white flesh, beige flesh, uh, orange flesh, and sometimes in one sweet potato root, you can find most of these colors together because the diversity is there. So, uh, why did, in all our study, we consider sweet potato, orange flesh, as a model for biofortified crop. We've discovered that just 100 gram of orange flesh sweet potato can have enough vitamin A required for a child under five per day. But look, 100 fresh, 100, one root of 100 gram is a very small root. Actually, to really fulfill the vitamin A deficiency in a family in Africa, which is has four or five children, husband and wife, you don't even need a big area to grow it. So the strategy and the approach and the model is doable. 
And that is what we base on it to be able to do our work. And also we find like if we feed the children with, with, with re vitamin A rich sweet potato, we can change the status of the nutrition in their, in their, in their, in, in their body. And we've proved that to, in our study where we have the control in the village, children that ate, children that did not eat the sweet potato, we could prove that those that ate, their level of vitamin A was much higher. It was the first time that we proved and this, this is what led to this huge group of biofortification, even to go over the crop, because we prove it with sweet potato in Mozambique. So, but again, though, it's interesting because we have so much uses of sweet potato. We could do it mashed yesterday at the World Food Prize lunch. We had mashed sweet potato. We could do bread. We could really take it to animal feeding to produce pork. We could also, in China, you know, the, the stems of sweet potato, they are using it to fry and to, to eat because it's an important source also of vitamin A. And in, in Africa, for example, if you see, we have, uh, how we say it? You see, there are, in Africa, they like sweet potato that are high dry matter. But in the US, we need, they like sweet potato that are low dry matter and very soft for dessert. Uh, uh, if you see in Asia, and parts of Southern Africa also, we have variety that is special for animal feeding. I, in Ghana, for example, you know, West Africa, they prefer sweet potato that is non-sweet. So we have a whole breeding program which is to select sweet potato that is non-sweet, which is similar to cassava or to yam, which people use as a staple food. And, uh, and is also ready to do the gari and porridge when you mix. So we have different uses of different sweet potato. So let me just take you up to see, like, because this work was very comprehensive. It's a 20 years work that we did. If I show you when I start, this is me. That's me. It is 20, to 20, to 20 years ago. And here you see Jan Lowe, also there, the lady that came last year to give a lecture. And these are all my colleagues, nutritionists, from the Ministry of Health. So, 97, we have no material, we did the adaptation trials. E, but everything happened at the same time. For the first time in 99, we have a meeting where we decided that we could use sweet potato to address vitamin A deficiency. And then in June 99, you see all happening at the same time, we have the first strategy to fight the deficiency of micronutrient in Mozambique. So. Again, uh, but at the same time, I was releasing, uh, in the year 2000, I released nine varieties that was introduced in Mozambique. Uh, and then we have uh, the flood of the year 2000. Every sweet potato you usually in Mozambique grow on the low land during around December. So all material lost in the, in the, in the low land. And then I took opportunity from this disaster to really do some developmental work. So we start distributing. We distribute around 2001, 2002 with this material introduced, which I consider the first generation of sweet potato to over 120 households in the village affected by flood. But at the same time, the government of Mozambique saw it was a very good model and a very good intervention. They gave us some money to really distribute in 2002, 2003 to 2006. And, but we create a slogan, because everything has slogan. We did our first nutrition sensitization campaign. You see these women are in the village dancing and promoting the vitamin A. And we had a slogan, Udosk da Saud. It means the sweet potato that give health. And this was our first harvest to promote around this time. But at the same time, three years later, we have the major drought. And uh, we had the major drought, but at the same time, at the same time with this drought, uh, there was a study in the village to prove that if you feed children with, with sweet potato, orange flesh, you can change their nutrient status in the blood. And this took in the deep place where the vitamin A deficiency is so bad in central Mozambique. And at the same time, 
we are doing also at the same time community nutrition to teach those women how to cook, how to feed those children, and how to address and to improve the life condition of them. But in 2005, we have a major drought where even the local material and the industrial material collapse. That is when we decide we, need, we don't need to introduce any more material from outside. We need to start breeding in Mozambique, for Mozambique and for the region. So, but at the same time, since the donor, since we, to, to release a variety, it takes eight years. So nobody wants to give me any money to wait for eight years to produce a variety. So I had to come up with new methodology, which is uh, reducing the number of years to release a variety from, four, from eight years to four years. And we, we, we invented, together with all my colleagues, uh, what we call accelerate breeding schemes. All the breeders that participate in it, in it was called uh, speed, speed breeders. We're all speed breeders. Uh -huh. so, so what we did so, and uh, we started doing this work, if you see, we used the near machine to, to select for the, for the vitamin A content, while we were also working on this to find out if indeed we could really show the improvement in the blood of children. But if you see, it is all participatory. Farmers help us a lot in the selection of what we really need. So if you see, in four years, I managed to release 15 drought-tolerant planting, drought-tolerant variety, which is going all over the place. It's proved also in the desert of Adubavi, in, uh, that is really tolerant to drought, and also it, it is, it is, it is, it is uh, salinity tolerant. So they are very good material. But we, we changed the sl slogan. This skirt in the village become the Mozambican suite that gives health. So I had a new design. The Mozambican suite, because it's no longer is local made, the material is from Mozambique, I changed the slogan. So, from this experience, then we create a major program in Africa, where we, we breed population and variety selection, then we have a transgenic weevil, then we work on our seed system, because it's very complicated, the seed system, and we work on our deliver system, and also we create platform. We have platform of West Africa, platform of East and Central Africa, and platform of Southern Africa. In Southern Africa, we dealt with drought. So, and we create what we see, uh, control, control crosses. This, these are all the breeders in Africa, because in 2003, we only, in 2005, there was only three. Now we have 17 centers, breeding centers in Africa to deal and you call the speed, speed, speed breeders. They all are crossing. And from this, the, from this time, we have released 42 orange flesh sweet potato varieties. And only in Mozambique, we released 20 varieties using the accelerated breeding scheme. So if you see our result, this is the yield that we have in, in a dry, dry matter base. This is, 2000, this is the year 2000. And we move them up to 2016 by 33%. There's a tremendous improvement on the methodology that we use. If you see, for example, the level of iron and zinc in our clones, we are moving them because our, our breeding material are much higher in iron and zinc than the Czech clones or the local material. So that is also improvement. At the same time, we create a lot of types of delivery system for the seed. We have what we call the triple S. But in the US, it's very common in North Carolina State University. Usually when you, you, you keep your seed in storage, and when it's for two weeks before the spring comes, you put your seed in the bed and do water. But in Africa, everything stays outside. If a place has a lot of uh, seven months of drought, and let's say five months of, of wet, being a vegetative propagate cro crops, they will die. So we 
adopt what is done in the US, we call triple S, save sweet potato, put it on storage and in sand. When the, the rain is almost coming, you take them out to sprout. And if you see, this is a sprouting sweet potato, this is in the sand, we call triple S, store sand and sprout. And also we create net tunnel, small tunnel that is in the farmer's field. These are all our creation where we keep sweet potato away from virus and other disease. And also we work in animal feeding, doing sea silage, and we link those women to groups of processors. You see, the roots will come, and the processing, making bakery, making bread, making cookies. And also, we link our work to health center, nutrition, and agriculture. And this work is taking place in Western Kenya. And it's very useful because those women that never go to prenatal care, because there is a taboo that say, if you tell you are pregnant, your children can die. But it will not be able to die because these are the belief. But knowing this, that there is so fine that they can receive in this health center, they go for prenatal. prenatal. And we see tremendous improvement with this, this methodology. So also when we do our work, we are very gender sensitive. Our material, 80, our beneficiary are 80% are female in the village. And if you see as in our breeding program, we distribute our seed to several other programs, including Africa and Asia. Uh, as a result of our work, today we have an umbrella, we could, which we call Sweet, Sweet Potato for Health Initiative in Africa. And we include 17 countries in Africa. There are 12 countries active. And we manage to distribute, to benefit close to 3 million households with our plant, with, with sweet potato result. This is a tremendous improvement with all this network we did. So this is, for example, this is a study that was conducted in the village to prove that like, you, could, you could change the nutrition status of a child by feeding them with orange flesh sweet potato. And it is proved, like, it is proved if you, if, you, if, you, if you do, if you distribute the, the roots, and you combine it with intensive program of, of nutrition, you have a demand creation, a demand creation, and you, could, and you could also, instead of feeding those children once or twice a day, you increase the feeding frequency, you could improve their nutrition status. So this is proven. And uh, our results show that uh, uh, vitamin A intake was much higher, that orange fresh sweet potato contribute to 35% of vitamin A intake and 6% of energy, and there was a decrease in vitamin A deficiency by 15%, and this work was published in a very scientific journal. Demand creation is quite important because, uh, you see, it's quite interesting to see what we did in the village. Theater group, because people don't know how to read, theater group to really tell them how important it is to feed those children. And we, we, we cook with them in the village and, and teach them how to feed their children with sweet potato. We make market painting the wall and to really promote it and link the farmers to the areas of commercialization. And we did a lot of processed product to, to, for income generation and also, to back up for, also for demand creation. And if you see also, we do have very high level advocacy because it's important to do the awareness campaign. This is all a visit that we have one secretary of state, Mr. Thomas Knight, that came to our program and you see all this place is orange. And this is me, all in orange, promoting my crop, orange flesh sweet potato. So we can go to that level. When we, 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 you see, all these women are dressing uh, on, the, on the thing and talking about orange fresh sweet potato. And here we have the Minister of Agriculture coming to visit our booth, our stand. At the same time, if you see, we are very much funded by, this is the, our actual USA, US ambassador in Maputo. So he comes and he was also distributing vine in a very, in a very deep community in the village with the vine and to the, the, those, those poor farmers.
so that we can go to that level. And our impact is very good because we prove that we could, with our intervention, improve the nutrition status of those people that receive, that receive the vine. But we have some lesson to say also because throughout this year we learn that first we need to multiply sufficient plant material. We, uh, it's very crucial. Uh, we need also to have demonstration plot uh, to create the demand at the farm level. We need to really have, have strong community nutrition uh, for, to increase demand of biofortified crop. We need also nutrition information to ensure that biofortified bio crop are integrated into child diet. And finally, we need multi-stakeholder multi to be able to go on scale. And we need go governments also to assist us in promoting. Because without government, we cannot go for policy. We can go no, 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 any longer. So I end up, if there is any question, this is, this is because you see like it, it has breeding program, it has city system, it has also a high level advocacy and high level intervention at the village. So this is what we did over 20 years to, to win this prize that we won last year because it's very innovative. It is science, it's also uh, innovation because we dealt with nutrition, we dealt with uh, seed, we, de we dealt with demand creation, all governments and all that to promote the crop that was in the f land, in the floor. Uh, one thing, when I came to Mozambique, if you find anybody eating the white fresh sweet potato in their household, they will hide because they had nothing, they, they are too poor. But today, with our work in Mozambique, sweet potato, 28% of sweet potato grown in Mozambique is, is, is orange flesh. Government has put sweet potato as a priority crop for nutrition, for food security and nutrition, and also it's this in their investment plan in agriculture. So that, 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 that one is very positive. Thank you very much. Yes. What is the difference between a yam and a sweet potato? Because we're told that most of our grocery stores around here, they're actually yams. So what is the difference? Yeah, I, I know. The yam that you see in the grocery store, store, they are sweet potato, but they call them yam. But they, the real yam that we call in Africa is different. It's the, another species. But they're both root crops. But what you see is yam, because I've seen it in North Carolina, in in Georgia, in Alabama, in Louisiana. They call it yam, but it is indeed sweet potato. Ah. Yes. Yes, uh, usually you know the color, the orange color is very attractive and uh, children love to eat because it tastes, it has a different aroma and the color is also very attractive. In the beginning though with the first generation of sweet potato that was introduced, it was very, not very high dry matter, the male consumer did not like it. But in 2011, I moved the dry matter content from an average of 23% to 31, which is a tremendous improvement. So nobody talks about sweet potato that is too watery anymore. But children love it, the female love it. And also now there is a movement of female coming out from the, uh, their work, going to buy what we call the golden bread. Do they give them a name? Golden bread is a, 
is a composite bread of sweet potato puree, 34% of sweet potato puree, and 60% of wheat flour. It is a biofortified bread, and they think this is very good for the diet. They said they can lose weight, but I keep quiet because <laughs> <laughs> I keep quiet. I mean, you see a line in the town where I live, those women go, and this is very sophisticated sweet potato right now. People will walk distance to go to buy the orange flesh sweet potato because it's healthier, it is helping you with problems of diabetes, all this. So it, it, the promotion we did really worked. But the, the children love the sweet potato, no doubt. <laughs> yes. Actually, uh, to really get this 15 drought tolerant variety, I had to work with uh, 481,000 clones in the breeding program for four years. However, as we select, there is this 15. But as we will reach a community, before we tell the, the people which to use, then we go again on the own farm trials in the community because you don't want to give a farmer's 15 things. So usually, they select their best three, and it stays in that community. But every year, because that is the way to go. Thank you. <laughs>Thank you, Dr. Andrade, for that stimulating and enlightening address. I guess it is good that I choose sweet potato fries and I go to the restaurant. <laughs> I hope nobody's kind of told you what we Americans do. You know, we put those sweet potatoes in a deep fryer and we make a perfectly healthy food less, less healthy. <laughs> But thank you. We're deeply grateful to you for being here. We know that our students have a busy schedule, have their class schedules, and you have a busy schedule with the World Food Prize. But thank you for taking time out of your week here in Des Moines to come to Grandview University. And I want to thank the World Food Prize again for making it possible for you to be here today. Most importantly, I want to thank, uh, thank all of you um, for being here at this, this part of our Global Vision Week. Uh, I hope that today's uh, presentation inspired many of you to think about the things that you're learning and how you can really make a, a significant impact in the world if you stay with it and if you uh, are persistent. And one of the things that struck me is that in this instant gratification world, uh, when you're dealing with these kinds of problems, it takes a lot of time. And when you say you had to accelerate eight years of work into four, you know, we're so used to having wanting instant answers and instant solutions to everything. But I think one of, part, one of the lessons that we can take away from here today is, is the, the persistence and to our science, uh, to our students in the sciences, just the, the length of time and the persistence that it takes. But what a tremendous impact you can have on the world. So thank you for being here, for your message, for your inspiration. And thank you to all, everybody else for being here as well. Have a good rest of the day.